I was just really frustrated because I was looking at all the software that existed and all the tools and it was all just complete crap. But as an engineer, I was kind of thinking, like, what would it take to just actually build software like Fort Knox from day one? And in my view, business continuity is important. Like in the health system, it's important. But you know, if you're a web design agency or something and you're, lo you're locked out of your laptop for a day or two, it's bad, but like you're not going to lose business forever. Um, but the other big one is data breaches. But if you lose all your customers' data forever, that's really bad. Hi there, and welcome to Stock Club, a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. In today's episode, we have My Wall Street's chief investor, Emmett Savage, interviewing Shane Kern, the founder of one of Ireland's most exciting startups, the cybersecurity company Evervault. The interview was conducted live as part of our Horizon members event last November. Before we get into the show, I just want to give a shout out to our friends at Vodafone Business. Now, if you're like us here at My Wall Street, you'll know that running a business is hard. There are countless things to think about, and many simply get ignored or completely forgotten about. Well, that's where Vodafone Business can help. They've crafted a suite of tools and supports to boost your business's operations. And the best part is it's free for everyone. From cybersecurity to harnessing the power of AI, building a website and improving how your teams work remotely, Vodafone Business will help you address the often overlooked but crucial elements for your business's success. To get started today, check out their one-to-one -one VHub digital support and advice service. You'll find everything you need right there. Find the link in our show notes or simply Google Vodafone VHub for more details. Now, let's get into the episode. So I'd like to introduce you to somebody who a lot of you will know. Uh, if not personally, a lot of you will know from Irish media, but I have a little bit of a story before I invite Shane on stage. Right, so 22 and a half years ago, an engineer who was a colleague of mine walked into the office and he was pure, one of the most skilled engineers I'd ever met. And he had a baby in a cot or one of those carry things for babies, <laughs> threw it under the table, the baby. I went, oh, good morning, Carol. Uh, he goes, oh, that's my new, oh, he's beautiful, that's Shane. And every so often he'd take him out and feed Shane Weedabix. And I watched Carol feed a brand new baby six Weedabix. Now, four is a challenge, even to someone of my frame. I remember thinking, what does a kid who has six Weedabix turn out like? Well, little did I know. So a few years later, Carol rang me and said, um, Shane is, uh, will you take Shane on as an intern for a summer? As I explained, I never say no up until recently. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I thought, I said, how old is he? Uh, he's 13. Oh, what are we going to do with him? I looked at John and we, we, we had no bandwidth for helping, you know, 13 year olds. And Carol said, he's really good at programming. And I said, okay, send them in. So Alejandro, our CTO from that day to this, said, oh, I'll give him a look at our code, our code base. And it gave him a read access to our code base of all our apps, which were very complex because they were fully integrated into the American financial system. And uh, Shane sat there and he read the code and he spotted bugs by reading it, which I'm told is tantamount to black magic because you're meant to run something that says there's a bug or at least look at the app. So I was like, that's amazing. Um, Shane, go ahead and get us two coffees there, would you? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, so I think on the way out for those coffees, he founded a business called Libramatic, which he sold to the library system of Ireland. No kidding, when he was a child. So we kind of, we, he was our coffee guy and our bug spotter. So we, we stayed in contact with Shane and, and good went from good, well, he went from good to great, to, to put it mildly. So a uh, few years more passed and he won Ireland's most prestigious science award, the BT Young Scientist Award. Uh, in fairness, it was a second chance. He tried the year before, but didn't win. Um, <laughs> came second, like that. no prizes for second, Shane. And, um, but he won it. And then that night, he was on the Late Late Show, which for those of you who are not Irish, which I think is nobody, um, <laughs> is Ireland's most uh, watched TV show. And let alone was this guy a bit of a science, like, genius, but he was able to sit there with the uh, former host of The Late Late Show and carry himself with such expertise and strength and strength of character. I was fucking telling him, that's, geez, he's going to come to something. Still, I couldn't spot it. Uh, another few years later, my phone rang and it was the most prestigious VC uh, venture capital firm, maybe in the world, Sequoia Capital. And they said, how you doing, Emmett Savage? I went, yeah, Sequoia Capital. I said, oh, I was wondering when you'd call. <laughs> and they said, could we interview about Shane Curran? I went, oh, yeah, right, go on. And I pulled in, and she spoke to me for about 40 minutes. I told her to read a big story, because uh, a good one. And, um, and then they wrote Shane a check for several million dollars. And 
everybody wanted to invest in Evervault. And I can tell you now, so do I. <laughs> and he is one of the smartest, most naturally uh, gifted young fellas I've met. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shane Kern. Quick reminder, folks, from our friends and sponsors of Stock Club Vodafone Business, check out their free one-to-one -one digital support and advice service today to discuss a range of topics from social media tips, cybersecurity, and building a website for your business. Search Vodafone VHub or check out the link in our show notes. Emmett promised a very good intro, and he wasn't lying. <laughs> right, okay, now I have got to interviewing you. I definitely have some notes. So Shane uh, founded Evervault, and um, Shane, I'd like to start by just explaining to the room uh, and to you just a little bit about one of the, our new product, Nexus. It turned out a name which didn't make it to publication called Cyberoo. And uh, Cyberoo is in the cybersecurity uh, space. They're listed on the Milan Stock Exchange. They're tiny, um, and I spoke to the management team before, and I didn't like something, so I vetoed it and said, no, we're not publishing that one. And one of the things I found, and if I may hit you with this, is that in the space, in the cybersecurity space, uh, according to IT Harvest Dashboard, the largest cybersecurity vendor database, there are 3,625 companies selling over 3,000 solutions in 17 categories in cybersecurity. What does Evervault do? <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, so, I mean, this is part, probably the main reason why I started Evervault initially, is um, in the last few years, there's been this kind of new executive position that's gone into the C-suite called the CISO, uh, Chief Information Security Officer. And their whole job is basically to report to the CEO and the board about the security posture of a company. And a lot of these companies, if they're publicly listed, they've existed for decades or centuries in some cases. And it's been a last minute thing where they've built up all this software over the years. They don't know how safe everything is. Um, and they have to present to the board. So they need a metric. Um, and like anything in business, once there's a metric, you have hundreds of vendors that kind of come in and um, they try to improve that metric by 10% or whatever. And you can justify the spend of a million dollars a year if this metric goes up by X. and you know, your risk goes down by why. And um, I was kind of thinking about this because you know, my background is engineering, as, as you know. Um, and I was just really frustrated because I was looking at all the software that existed and all the tools. And it was all just complete crap because the distinction I draw between the kind of the two ways of thinking about security are you've kind of got like statistics and calculus where most companies are solving the statistical approach where they're trying to make your company 5% more secure or 10% more secure by alerting you about one particular type of vulnerability or something like that. Um, and you buy hundreds of these tools and on average or in aggregate, the metric improves by X. Um, but as an engineer, I was kind of thinking, like, what would it take to just actually build software like Fortinox from day one? And there's kind of two problems that can arise if you have an issue with cybersecurity. One is business continuity, where uh, if your software gets breached or your company gets breached, uh, your business goes down. Like in, in Ireland, this happened with the HSE a few years ago where people literally couldn't get into their computers. I looked at that and I was like, eh, this is kind of hard. Uh, I don't really know how you can solve that with software. Um, but the other big one is data breaches. Um, it's a big problem if a company gets hacked, they lose a bunch of sensitive data. There's regulatory fines. You know, If you're a big company, it's 4% of your annual revenue in Europe. Um, if it's credit cards, it's $18 per card and so on. Um, and in my view, business continuity is important. Like in the health system, it's important. But you know, if you're a web design agency or something, and you're locked, you're locked out of your laptop for a day or two, it's bad. But like, you're not going to lose business forever. But if you lose all your customers' data forever, that's really bad. Um, and ha having done some digging on it, uh, what well, was clear is that the best way of solving this was using encryption. Um, encryption is a really simple process in theory. It's you take a piece of data and you take a key, and then you encrypt the data with the key. And if you have the key stored separately and you have the encrypted data, you can publish everything on a billboard. You don't have to worry about any of the sensitive data going missing. Um, but the big problem with that was that to do encryption properly, you have to read academic papers for six months. All this stuff is written in literally the 1970s. So uh, when you go to a website today and it's got a green lock in the top left, um, that paper was originally published in 1978. Uh, it's called ORSA. And it's still the same tech. Like There's some small changes that have been made to it, but nothing had really changed. Um, and for some of the stuff I was doing for my Wall Street or Rubycoin at the time, um, 
I was just kind of used to you know charging a credit card in a couple of seconds, uh, sending an SMS in a couple of seconds using all these kind of really nice developer tools. But security was still kind of the wild west where you had to read all this stuff and understand it. Um, so I started Evervault with the idea of what would it take to take all this kind of complicated encryption stuff that solves like a real business problem and actually secures organizations rather than improving some metric. Um, so yeah, four years ago, started Evervault. We, um, we basically provide building blocks for software developers to encrypt sensitive data anywhere they collect it and still let them do stuff with it. So instead of just encrypting and decrypting stuff and just putting the key in the same place as everywhere else, uh, we give you tools so you can you know, use your own source code to um, run analytics on the data, share it with third parties, and so on. Um, so if even if you have been breached, and I think most companies should just assume that they have been breached and treat their security accordingly, there's no risk of anything going missing because it's all been restricted and locked down to what it's originally been intended for. Uh, you, you know well, Shane, in Silicon Valley, they have very short attention spans, and you have to explain everything as if you're talking to a five-year-old. So how would you describe Evervault to your nana, your granny? Yeah, um, it's basically a jewelry box for sensitive data. So you can put all your sensitive data in there, um, credit cards, passport scans, all this sort of stuff that you don't want the whole world knowing. And then you can put your hand in the rubber glove, still do stuff with it, you know, play around with the credit card numbers and so on, but everything's still locked away in the jewelry box. Before we go into your career, and I'd love to also talk about, you know, the investable opportunities in this space. Um, did you drop out of college? Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. I did. Okay, well, I advised you not to, so I'm glad you didn't listen to me. <laughs> I remember Shane saying, I'm thinking of dropping out of college, and the Irish conservative in me said, oh, no, no, don't do that. No, that's not good. Well done. <laughs> uh, um, and I say that in the knowledge that <clears throat> my son is in the room and I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how have things, so when did you found Evervault, remind me, and just give us a very quick storyboard of where you are now. Just tell us the, the broad brush uh, strokes, if you like, of the storyboard of the business. Yeah, so uh, as a correction, I never actually dropped out of college. I'm oh. still, I'm on sabbatical oh, nice. from UCD. So. Uh, so you still have a foot get, in the door. Well done. Yeah, I got a, a get cheap haircuts. Business and law, I thought. Business and law, ah. yeah. Everyone thought I'd do physics or computer mm -hmm. science or something, so I tried no, to prove it wrong. But um, yeah, uh, went to college for a couple of weeks, went on sabbatical um, for the cheap haircuts and cheap burritos and stuff like that, <laughs> which I clearly don't use. Um, and uh, yeah, so started Evervault October 2019. Um, that was around the same time that you would have got the call from Sequoia doing yeah. their their diligence, which obviously yeah, that was a bit paid off. It, was, it wasn't for us, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so we had initially raised about $3.2 million led by Sequoia. Um, kind of spent a couple of years building out the initial team, launching the product and so on, uh, before eventually raising a Series A um, of 16 and a bit million dollars from uh, Sequoia as well as a few others like Index Ventures. Um, so today we're uh, about 35 people. Um, based between Dublin and London, uh, our customers, we kind of serve all sizes because we're a developer tool, but everything from you know one or two person startup building their first product to um, some of the oldest banks in America, uh, large healthcare institutions and so on in the States. Um, so mostly kind of US based customers um, and somehow we're managing to do it from Dublin mostly. Well, how do you differentiate when you're talking to a prospective buyer? How are you saying, explaining to them that your product is superior to CrowdStrikes or Datadogs or any of those kind of business? Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody's ever read Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Um, it's a great book for the foundations of business philosophy, I guess, in general. But one of the main kind of rules in that is avoid competition. Um, so to your point about there being thousands of different cybersecurity vendors, instead of just competing based on you're going into a pitch saying we have a better product because this feature, we have this feature and the other competitor doesn't or whatever. Um, we basically just decided to target a different buyer. Um, so instead of these thousands of companies selling to a CISO, um, one of the challenges that we saw was that the people that are actually implementing the changes at the CISO's request are the CTO. So the engineers that are actually you know, writing the code, building the product and so on. Um, and it turns out that's just been a hugely underserved market in general um, because they hate doing the security work. You know, it's logging into your Amazon web services and going through all these policies and procedures to tighten things up. Um, so we were like, why don't we take all of the work that the CISO is asking the company to do or is asking the engineers to do, but build the tooling that speaks directly to the engineers. And um, so if you look at security tooling for engineers, um, I haven't looked at the latest Harvest IT report, is that what it was called? Um, but I'd imagine that the number of vendors there is, is far, far fewer. Um, and as a result, it's been much easier for us to sell into CTOs. Uh, we also just speak their language a bit better, I think, because um, we have a very engineering-focused culture, whereas CISOs are very 
compliance driven, a lot of them have kind of legal backgrounds and uh, it's just a very different mindset, although they're solving the same problems. When you talk about a business, it's vulnerabilities um, and every business has vulnerabilities. Uh, what do you see as the greatest vulnerability in a business and its data? Because if you ran a butcher, you have a pile of data. I was in my pharmacist recently, and um, she was doing a big clear out of the database, which is a very old pharmacy. And she said, guess how many emails are on our system? And I said, 50,000. She goes, no higher. And I said, 100,000. She goes, no way more. And I said, 500,000? She goes, more. I said, no, no, that's not possible. How, what, have you taken the email of everybody in the country? She goes, no, we're just around since time began, and da 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 And I realized my local pharmacy has the, collected this ab absolute abyss of, collect, uh, of data and people's contact details, and I realized that I could actually talk her into giving me that database, and I thought about it. So why are... <laughs> So, uh, what is the greatest vulnerability in a business because they exist everywhere? Yeah, so um, we serve companies that are very kind of technically minded. They've kind of got all the most if or the kind of the table stakes stuff squared off. Um, but the reality is about 90% of businesses, or I made that number up, but a lot of businesses haven't solved these. And they're all kind of people problems, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what way you're looking at it. Um, but it's kind of like three things, really. Um, the first is phishing. Um, so people here probably get emails all the time from what looks like Google or what looks like um, you know, Salesforce or whatever, saying um, you log in and, uh, and whatever else. Mine are uh, a lot more modest, the toll bridge. Yeah. A click here, you didn't pay your toll bridge. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, and they, they all ask for the same data. You know, you, you type in your email address, you type in your password, and you don't think about it. Um, so just really good uh, education and training for employees within a company um, solves a huge amount of issues there. There's a lot of kind of red flags that you look for. Like, is it actually from a domain name and you know, is it TLS encrypted and so on? Um, so that's number one. Number two is social engineering. Um, it's just training people to know that if they get a phone call from someone claiming to be the bank manager or uh, you know, a financial advisor or something like that, um, that they just don't give information out over the phone. Because the vast majority of data breaches and almost all data breaches in very small businesses happen this way. Uh, and then the third is if you're a company that build software or um, has a lot of kind of third party partners, just make sure you do due diligence on them because the moment you start using a third party tool, you're handing over, not only do you have all the data, you're handing over all the sensitive data to them. So just making sure that they have decent security compliance certifications and so on, not that compliance is evidence of security, but just do your due diligence on any third party vendors and those three, um, you know, unless nation states are after you or mm -hmm. whatever, then you should be fine. So I can't, I can't have an expert in one of the most pertinent domains in the world uh, on the stage without asking them, what three businesses that are publicly listed do you most admire and why? Or maybe to rephrase the question, who do you see out there and think they are going to be to cybersecurity what Microsoft was to uh, business software? Yeah, so the, um, the general trend, and going back to this point about there being so many vendors, is that any new company that comes around and they have an amazing new technology that they sell to CISOs, um, they all get to a point where you know, they have a couple million a year in revenue or whatever, they've proven out that the product works and they have great tech, um, but they basically end up being bought by these kind of large platform players. Um, because CISOs are exhausted getting pitches from um, all these new startups building new tools, they basically just want to have like two or three go-to go -to, um, vendors that they can buy everything from. Uh, and I think the front runner in that for me is uh, this company Palo Alto Networks. Um, there's, you know, from, from an investment perspective, there's a few things you can consider there, but um, they're looking like they'll be the first company to a uh, $100 billion market cap. I think they're at 75 or $80 billion now, roughly. Um, but they've achieved that by initially having a really good product, and then they just basically layered onto their entire platform every other cool startup. You know, if you look at their press page or their investor relations page, they're acquiring companies every other week, especially now that they're a little bit cheaper because some of these venture-backed businesses are cash-strapped. Um, so they're one uh, that I think will win and are likely to kind of trend towards maybe not a trillion dollar company, but certainly between 100 and a trillion somewhere. Um, the other one I really like because they're much more infrastructure focused and um, they have a lot of this, the same functionality from a security perspective, but designed for people who have stuff on the cloud. Because um, Palo Alto Networks sell a lot to kind of non-cloud companies, but the cloud native company that I really like are Cloudflare. Um, some great things are 
setting aside their product, which like, we use, for example, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, they have pretty high insider ownership, I think. Uh, the founders and or the founding team own pretty material chunk, like high single digit percentage, I, I think. Um, so I really like them and love the product. Um, and I know you did caveat it by saying publicly listed, but there's other, this other company called Wiz, who are um, very new. I think they were the fastest company ever to reach $100 million a year in annual recurring revenue. Um, so still privately listed, $10 billion market cap, which as we all know in the private markets doesn't mean a huge amount with the volumes being so low. Um, but they're basically building uh, basically better versions of all of these different products and then tying them together in a very kind of opinionated way where if you're kind of the forward thinking cloud security leader, um, Wiz are very cool. And I think if they just continue the way they're going, um, don't buy the IPO, obviously, as we heard a while ago, but mm -hmm. when they do go public, give it a couple of years and they should be good. So before I let you go, I'm asking for a friend. Uh, what do you think of CrowdStrike? Uh, great business, yeah. Um, I uh, Between Palo Alto Networks and CrowdStrike, they kind of target slightly different things. I think, um, again, on the insider ownership part, I think uh, Palo Alto Networks are materially lower. It's like maybe 1% or 2% or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think CrowdStrike is still very founder-led, founder-owned, mm -hmm. um, and also a really great product where a lot of the customers that we work with rave about it. And we do a lot of work kind of just asking what other products our customers use to see what makes sense for us to build into and Christ mm -hmm. comes up all the time. Great. Well, Shane Kern, uh, we could talk to you all night uh, and it's a privilege to have you on stage with me. Uh, keep on the Weedabix. They clearly are doing great things. I'm on to um, 12 a day now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll all have a chat with you at the back of the room at the end of the night. All right, lads, before we finish up, I just want to give another shout out to our friends at Vodafone Business. If you're a business owner in need of a leg up when it comes to your digital transformation, get yourself over to Vodafone VHub to book your appointment today. Find the link in our show notes for more details. And that's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Shane. He's truly one of the up and coming stars of the Irish tech scene and beyond. Uh, remember, if you have any questions you'd like answered or elevator pitches you'd like us to tackle, make sure to get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at MyWallStreetHQ, on TikTok at MyWallStreet, or simply just email us at pod at MyWallStreet.com. If you're enjoying the show, make sure to leave us a review, we'll tell your friends about us, send us into the WhatsApp group, whatever whatever way you can do to help us out. It would be very much appreciated. And thanks again, and we'll talk to you next week.